Shut up and sit down. Hello, everyone, and welcome into a read out short clip here. Uh, this is from our latest episode. Hope you enjoy. Well, I know, I mean, last time I remember, I mean, this was probably a month and a half or so ago, I remember me and you were on the podcast, and I was like, he's a stone-cold a-hole. And, you know, I think karma came back and bit him in the butt. Like, he couldn't hire anybody besides family members and retreads and everything else. And, you know, that's how you collapse so quickly when you don't have somebody like Mark Jackson, like, papering over your mistakes for you. Yeah, absolutely, which is why I agree with you, Devin, that Louisville is a big winner, even if they don't get even if Braun doesn't come back, and I think he will, but even if he doesn't, you're still better off by just firing. I mean, for the love of God, they got a quarterback commitment like the day after Bobby got fired, or like yesterday. Like, it's so dumb. So, well, since we're on topic with this, um, Mm -hmm. with Louisville losing Bobby Petrino, who would be your next coach? Could you land... Jeff Braun or Bust. You think it's Jeff Brom? Brom or Buzz. Okay. Now, what yeah. I was going to throw out a scenario here, do you think Willie Taggart's going to be fired this year? No. You don't think so? I, I would hope not. Being his first season at Florida State, he doesn't really have the talent yet that can, you know, and he's a recruiting coach. That's all he, That's his big yeah. strength is bringing in kids. I was going to say, if Florida State does toss him at the end of the year, could we see a Willie T come to Louisville because that would be the smaller mid-major that he would go for. Well, power five, I guess. Yeah, well, so there's two things on that. One, I don't think that there's a lot of interest in um, the Louisville Athletic Department in taking a coach who um, is being let go. I think they just they just fired a coach. They probably wouldn't spend you know $4 million on a guy um, who couldn't perform in one year. I think that would go over pretty poorly. Um, and then two, ag- again, it is absolutely in this in Louisville. It is Brommer bust. Uh, there is a lot of smoke around it. Uh, lots of people in the media who are really, really close to Brom and really close to the situation firmly believe that it's going to happen. Uh, now, they're, he's not going to give Louisville like again all the media. So he, he's not doing a home count discount, right? Like, yeah, he comes home and it's great, and it's awesome, uh, and that's definitely a plus, right? You get to go. I mean, they're the first family of Louisville when it comes to football. I mean, everybody loves the Broncos. Like that's that's just part of it. But he's yeah, got to get paid. Dad, the dad Oscar was like a quarterback in the '60s. All three sons played there and took him to yeah, prominence. I mean, it's, the Fiesta Bowl and the Orange Bowl. So yeah, I mean, but the deal is okay. And, and this is this is kind of where you start worrying about like the carousel if you're if you're rooting for you. That was okay. One, who else is coming open this year? Two. Uh, Next year looks like the next off season, not this kind of the one after. Looks like you're going to have the huge openings. Your Ohio State, your Auburn, your some of these big dog jobs are coming open. And, and the worry amongst a few people is, okay, does he just wait another year and then do that? I think he comes to Louisville. They're going to open the checkbook. They've got the money. Um, yeah, I, I learned over this week that the buyout isn't all at once for Bobby. They have saved for this eventuality. They can pay it off over the rest of the course of his contract, which is forever long. Um, it's only a couple mil a year. Not that big of a deal. I, I agree. I think I think Brom is going to be our dude. I think, um, or as far as going to be Louisville's guy. Um, <laughs> yeah, I wish. Yeah, and I know a lot of Brom beaters think the same thing, but um, yeah, it would be nice. Yeah, and I called them Brom beaters because they're kind of the ones that beat the drums whenever it's like, well, you know, you know, well, he wasn't like that, and then it's kind of so. Um, so we'll go ahead and talk about the game a little bit here. Western loses to FAU. Uh, did either of you watch the game? <laughs> I did. You did. Okay, good, good, good. Jake, did you watch? <laughs> Somebody did. I, no, I did, did too. I did too because I wrote the recap, but it was. The most abysmal thing I can I can say I've watched probably this year. Um, of course, I've got notes because the way I write the recap, yeah, I, I wrote I, I, I write I down every scene. The paper, you're like Jim Rome over there. Yes, Jim Rome. Um, I mean, there were highlights to the game where I thought things were good, and then there's the constant nagging issues. Um, we have not had a consecutive quarterback start this year. That's my big nagging issue with this game. Hey, you're going to have one this week. So Duncan's getting the start again? 
He is. He will yeah. be getting the start this week, according to uh, the newsy stuff online. And then, is Eccles hurt? I heard he was hurt during the game. Oh, I do not believe Eccles is hurt. I'm sorry. I mean, why play him anyway? He's going to be, the season's over. You need to play, play people that could be here next year. I mean, it made no sense against yeah. middle while I did that. I, I, I concur. I think at this point, with the fan base lighting the torches and you know, basically forming a mob, I think you have to build for the future and, you know, just build up the best quarterback you think, and that's your horse that you're going to ride out for the rest of the season, you know. Um, They should have done this a long time ago. I know that Duncan had some inconsistencies, but if that's his guy... That's who you go with. Eccles is is so stupid. And as I said after that, the last time I said he was hurt, he's got loser's limp. He's not hurt. Like... He he may or, he may or may not be I don't know uh, but my issue is 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 he your guy though you know and that's my thing that yeah keeps, the dude hadn't played in how many games yeah you you don't get enough sample size like with the yo yo end of the quarterbacks like I don't think any of them had or any of them had enough time to work out the kinks and say okay well you know grow you know what we've been complaining about Sanford period he hasn't grown as a coach you can't blame whether it be Shanley or Duncan for being inconsistent and you know being kind of rusty when you you play one game you get hurt you get pulled blah 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 like you know play, let's see how he progresses from two starters in a row and see what happens. I agree. I, I, you honestly, gotta, think that, I honestly think that was just uh, Sanford grasping at straws because I mean we I mean when do you think he thought like the job was starting to slip away? I mean two or three games in when he starts like Shanley Duncan Eccles. Uh, I think I think Charlotte, to Charlotte was the game win. one. What was that, Ross? I think Charlotte was the game where we said, "Oh shit, sorry." Uh, that, <laughs> you know, uh, won't kill us. You know, we lost to a team that's coaches on the hot seat that's never done anything, and they had a whole bye week to prepare for it, and they just got blown out by them. I think that's when the wall started coming in on Sanford. Ross, I mean, I don't know what your football coaching experience is, but. In my opinion, when you look at a coach who has started three different quarterbacks and even, well, even throwing Thomas in there, you know, putting four in the game, it's almost like he's guessing. You know, I feel it's like a little kid guessing what's which hand's it in. At this point, he's just guessing he has no idea what's going on. That's my I mean, it's opinion. It's like you're trying to guess a play on Madden. Like, it's not going to work. Yeah, I mean, you. what are you going to do? Line up in the hole? I mean, what's going on here? But um, just looking at the game, the notes I took from the game um, – they had they had a lot of potential going into FAU. FAU's offense is still super, but they're not as good as they were. Um, of course, they came off a really big win last week, beating beating FIU, which was a surprise to me. Um, Division leading FIU. Hey, where the... What were you saying, Jake? Go ahead, Jake. No, I just said division leading FIU. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, and I thought that was weird. Like. Who at the beginning of the season? I mean, I know we thought FIU would be better. I mean, but who would have thought, like, at the start of the season, it's like, oh, yeah, the good win over FIU? Okay. Well, I mean, they did win eight games last year. They weren't awful. I mean, Butch Davis is a hell of a coach. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, FIU, is, FIU is a strong team. And, I mean, I don't think anybody thought that they were going to be division leading, but... Um, I think they definitely have a a, uh, a a chance at the conference championship this year. Do they now? I mean, they hold they hold the tiebreaker against Middle, so as long as they don't slip up, you know, these last two games, they're going to play UAB in the championship. So, so who do you take in the championship? UAB or FAU or FIU? I'm sorry. Too many F and U's. <laughs> Uh, so who do you I'd have? I'd say you got to take UAB. Yeah, I they think so too. Game yeah, they look good. Against they look good. I, I agree. I think that's one of those that you got to take UAB because they're doing they're awesome this year. As far as I mean, they're ranked. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, let's see here, real quick. Uh, well, while we're on topic, Ross, let's talk a little bit about your article here. Uh, it's a really t- popular article. Um, I tried to find it Most on the right all time. Yeah, yeah. There's no yeah. argument there, right? Uh, some people yeah. debate it as to if it was that popular, but apparently it's really popular. Um, 
Uh, I'm going to go through some of the headlines here, and let's see what your take is. Um, with the program where it was in December of 2016, um, and actually, I'll, let me let me let me change topics here just for a second. Um, I heard, and I don't know if you heard this or not, with the announcers during the game, that Mike Sanford said that with his one and nine team, or one and eight, or whatever they are, that the locker room is in a better place than it was last year. What do you think about that, Ross? Just awful. I mean, just because you don't have some some people that you know are questioning what you do, you're one and nine. Like, I also heard him say a comment about you know, well, we're not going to shortcut and take JUCOs and transfers and blah 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 blah. That was my next one. Yeah, you got to do that at this level. I mean, you can go down the list. I know in our in our group chat thing, they Brom had nine or ten impact players. You know, Holt, Dangerfield, Grant, uh, Mike White. Like you got to fill in gaps with transfers and stuff. That's just how it works at this level. And by bragging because you're not doing that, it's just it's just another it's just another X on his on his whole tenure here. It's it's kind of disgusting. I, I concur. I think it's the same thing. You got to fill the gaps, um, and you may not get the talent that you need at X position, but you need to find someone who is talented at a JUCO or whatever and get that in there. Uh, Jake, what's your take? Well, not like that, but it, it, it's so tone deaf, right? Like you're sitting at a one and nine season. You are hemorrhaging uh, at every at every point. You cannot score points. You cannot defend. You are simply failing at everything. And then, and granted, they were pretty class next year. Okay, fine, whatever. But, and then he's got the got the cojones to say, oh, well, you know, the locker room is in better shape. How in yeah, the locker room in better shape? Because you don't have NFL players in there? Is that why it's in better shape? Uh, he's, well, he's it's, saying it's in better it's shape. So stupid. Well, no, he, I know. He's saying, that's what I'm being kind of, I'm being a smart ass guy, but. He's in better shape because he doesn't have anybody questioning him. That's what it is. He doesn't have anybody who's who is leading the team that was really under the old system. Because let's be honest, uh, we don't have that many seniors in the seniors that we do have. Like Eccles isn't leading this team. Let's be real. Whether it hurt or not, he has not had the performance that he had thought. Rode the bench for five years, for four years. He's doing it again. Uh, yeah, I, I mean the grad I hate to rag on the kid. I mean, he lost two just, of them that would be leaders he's, right he's, now. So it's just bad. It, it is yeah. bad. Um, and, of course, I think that goes on into your next heading here, deci- uh, deciding to drastically change the program instead of easing into the transition. I think, of course, those for me, those seemed like excuses, that the locker room is in better shape this year than it was last year. Well, last year you had a winning record, uh, so I don't know what your argument is there. Losing record after the ball game. Yeah, losing record after the yeah. ball game. Uh, but he was 500 going into it, so, I mean, there's kind of a little bit – and that whole bowl game just ugh, still gets all over me. But anyway, I, w- I was down in Orlando, and you could tell the whole team had checked out. It was that's when I knew, okay, we could have problems. But I still gave him the benefit of the doubt heading into this season. And then the main game was like, here we go again. So my my whole point is like, he I think Stanford would have been great taking over a program like UTEP or somewhere where. You can do that complete culture change because you're used to losing. But to take it, you know, programs with 10, 12 and 11 back to back wins, conference championships, winning, 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 you know, six straight seasons of winning, and to say, we're going to do it this way, I'm going to teach you guys how to, the pursuit and all this other nonsense. It's just, A, it was corny, and B, you're not going to get a veteran team to buy into that. So all the goodwill you could have built this, you know, last year and maybe could have bought him some more time this year to come to head because he blew a veteran late in roster. Well, and I, I think another argument here is that he had a um, – he came off of those two championship years, so even if there was a talent drop or anything, he's going to be facing an uphill battle from the fan base because of, you know, they were winning big, they were doing this, and, I mean, according to – what those announcers said, even some of the players, the veteran players themselves, were having issues with it because they didn't continue the big wins. And I I agree with you on everything in this, but it's just, it's hard to argue that he needs to stay. And there are stoic uh, people out there who are saying, 
give him another chance. And I, I'm with you all that that chance has come and gone. There's about two online that I can think of, and that's about it. But they're, they're all excuses. probably two, like, in the whole state. <laughs> yeah, their whole excuse is, well, he's a young coach, blah, 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 blah. I mean, at the end of the day, we can go through all these point by point, but it, he was just a massive, massive misjudgment by Todd Stewart. And you know what? You can't bet a 1,000. I mean, we hit three yeah, exactly. in a row with Taggart, with Katrina, with Braum. You can't you can't hit them every time, and the only way I think you could have prevented a bad hire is if you would have you know realized how big of a cultural shift it was going to be, how different the styles were going to be, how green Sanford really was when he was jumping from. I mean, he had an impressive resume: Stanford, Boise, no game, but he was never anywhere for two or for more than two seasons before he bounced on to the next one. So. You know, I think he kind of got, you know, he kind of kept climbing and thinking, that, oh, this is going to, you know, attach myself to not good coaches. But when it was on him, this is where, you know, your ability to organize, to run an offense, to have a quality staff. When you're hiring people from, you know, Division two or position coaches and yada, 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 you know, he just kind of had a giant misjudgment of how what it takes to be a head coach, which someone like Braun before him was – probably like 44 and had just you know that much more experience to go off of i I saw some stuff on twitter where they they were talking about that how you know did you expect um, it was was like a national writer somebody that knew uh sanford from previous jobs like in Notre dame is like well you know would you would you have thought that sanford was going to be this bad this fast at western and the guy was like well no because he seemed super sharp but there were people close to him um who this person knew who said he wasn't really ready to do the nitty gritty like program management stuff that you need in order to be an effective head coach? And if anything was going to get him, it was that, which is surprising. Uh, not that they said that, but that when you look at what actually happened, was not only does he seem ineffective at managing the day to day of the program, but he also seems fairly ineffective at actually play calling. Which Notre Dame got better when he left, so. Well, um, I think, well, first I'll touch on Ross's point. Um, Todd Stewart's allowed a miss every now and then um, because Absolutely. because definitely, it, is, definitely. it is like a racehorse in a way. You know, he is basically going to a track, metaphorical track, and betting on a horse. Yeah, um, so you look at it and you're like, well, blah, 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 you know, this guy's the youngest coach, yada, yada, yada. And like you said, with his resume, I mean – it was hard to argue, and there was no point in his resume that said, well, this is iffy, I mean, besides his age. Um, and, yeah, Jake, I have I know of a few fans who are stoic, you know, that are very appreh- apprehensional about giving him a, another year, but as far as I'm concerned, that fourth and whatever on their own 15-yard line against Maine was the game that I just unplugged. Yeah. You got to pull the plug there. I'm sorry. Um, for me, it was the Louisville game. You think it was Louisville? For me, it was Louisville. Boy, because that Boy, was it. Because that's a game where you had every every chance to win, Power 5, in-state rival, their garbage, your garbage, but maybe your less garbage, and you got a shot to beat them at home, and you, you just you pee down your leg. Uh, How much? He could have got so many miles out of that win, too. Like, he oh could be God. sitting at, I mean, I firmly believe if he wins that game, we probably win two more games, but... You know, he could he could have a four and eight year, but he could sell, hey, I beat Louisville, even if it was the worst Louisville team since Ron Cooper. But like we got so much mileage out of those two Kentucky wins over two win teams, you know, that could have given him a lot of a little bit of hedge to say, Hey, stick with me. But said he just blew that like he has every close game. I agree. The thing is with the Louisville game though, I think that he could sit at two and ten by beating Louisville and beating Ball State. And say, um, you know, well, I beat Louisville and I beat Ball State. You know, maybe the conference was up this year, yada, yada, yada. It's a rebuilding year, but he had two wins. I think that a Louisville win would have at least given him a little leverage to, to negotiate from being put on the chopping block. But Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, w- Without question, I think that, that an actual Power 5 win over a team that at the time people perceived as not the best, but not the absolute garbage heap that they are now. But, yeah, that absolutely would have given him so much more leash. 
Um, okay, so kind of speeding it along here. This week, uh, God, we talked about Louisville too much. Um, yeah. This week we play uh, the UTEP Miners. Uh, this is the bottom five and six game of the century from what I heard earlier. Um, <laughs> Western is at 0-6 and 1-9 and overall, and UTEP is 1-5 and 1-9 and and overall. Um, who did they beat? Rice, I'm assuming? Rice. Yeah, okay. So if you, if you look at their, their A, we're a point favorite. And uh, if you look at, you kind of look at their recent results. Let's let's just go down. You know, they, they played MTSU, who just beat us pretty tough. They lost 48-32, uh, to 32, so 18-point margin. What did we lose? 29-10 to 10 against them. So similar results, but they could score. And, you know, we know that's our problem. They beat the Rice team where they, they ran out of, early against them and then kind of, you know, ran off gas but held on. And then, you know, before that they played UAB 19 to nothing, who's going to win the conference. And Louisiana Tech only lost by seven. North Texas only lost by three. So you go by their their last month or month and a half of the season, they've shown improvement why we keep getting worse. And that's that's why this game worries me more than anything. Well, uh, Jake, what's your take on it, buddy? I mean, to be perfectly honest, I, I think that – they are defeated. I, I, I'm not saying he's – a lot of these kids are his, uh, like not just the ones he recruited, but they, they do seem to care about him. So I don't want to say he's lost the locker room, but it does look like there's a, there's an effort problem. It does look like they don't know what they're doing out there, and I think that comes from the top. And like, like Ross says, look, even though both teams this year have a history of close losses, you know, Western's lost a bunch by, by three or so, those were, Not recently. <laughs> as we've progressed, they've gotten, like, the two teams are almost, like, intersecting and going opposite ways. And so it's like, mm, I honestly think this is probably UTEP by, like, seven, but Lord knows. I don't know. The whole stadium could burn down and both teams lose. Who, who knows? Actually, we're supposed to get seven in this one. Um, but, but which, yeah, as we have found, no, is Vegas seven. is not no. watching this year. They, they just aren't. Why would they? Um, Ross, what were you I, saying, I don't, buddy? I don't, I don't like this. <laughs> I'm not. Here, here's, a, here's one thing that we haven't brought up on the podcast yet that I really want to hear your guys' thoughts on it is um, you probably saw the article from Brad Stevens this week about basically the ultimatum that's the insider in the program said. Sanford loses both, he gets fired. He, he wins both, he keeps his job, and he splits. Who knows? Like... What are you guys' thoughts on that? I mean, does a win over UTEP really prove that things are going in the right direction? And I mean, I think the what is it, yeah, almost twenty-five game body of work just speaks for itself. And you know, a win over a one-win UTEP, and you know, I, I don't see any way they lose Tech next week. So, I, it's another short-sighted thing. The only thing I can think about that is it's just another thing to motivate the players before you know. So they actually play hard the last two games. Uh, Jake, I'll let you go ahead and take it, and then I'll uh, jump in on that. How about that? Yeah, so for me, that's almost like bringing an entire like multi-million dollar decision down to like sudden death, winner take all, you know, <laughs> double or nothing type of tactics. Like, why, why would a win over a bad UTEP team and a middle-of-the-road La Tech team change, like Rush said, Two years worth of data and evidence. How in the world could that justify, you know, saving 300K maybe? I just don't see it. I don't understand it. It cannot be true. I, I firmly believe, look, everybody lies every day, right? And I'm not saying Talk Tom Stewart McClain. or whoever those sources were are, are liars, but I'm saying that I think it's, as we say in the legal profession, that's mere puffery. It's not really a lie, but they're not. They're being disingenuous when they say it. I think it's a tactic, and I don't care. He beat UTEP by 20 and beat La Tech by a touchdown or two. I don't care. The dude cannot do the job. He needs to get run out of town on a donkey. Um, but I mean, if they won each game by 30 points, and you could point to, hey, we actually got it, but there's been zero evidence that it's going to click. So I, I just don't believe it. Uh, my my thing my thing is though, what if you lose to UTEP and you beat Law Tech? 
UTEP is the worst team out of the two, and LaTeX, supposed to, as Jake said, was a mediocre team. Um, seven and three LaTeX, though. Yeah, well, it's seven and three LaTeX, and it's like really. So you're going to beat, you're going to lose to this crappy team. So does that that tells me that it's either preparation or it's a mentality issue on the team as to that they can't you know keep the concentration and going to beat them. Um, but. I, I I think he's got to go. I don't think I think whoever told that I won't say that they were fibbing or you know misleading or anything, but I think that I think they just said that just so people would pay attention. Um, but he's got to go. <laughs> or it's, maybe they got they got told that by somebody in the program. Maybe maybe a or, an assistant to an assistant SID or something. Who knows? Who knows? I mean, even a player may have her overheard yeah, something. Right. I don't know, but. At the same time, it's like who cares? Um, you beat if you beat UTEP, why does he stay? If you beat Law Tech, okay, they're a mediocre team, and you might could argue some progress there. But is it? I mean, after all the debacles, the only way, the only way he, you can justify it's we're not going to fire him because of the buyout. And if you win the last two games, we can spin that. And that's like the only way I can see it. It's all about yeah. spin with the fan base. Well, and of course. From what I've heard, and I don't know how necessarily true this is, but based off the firings and buyouts from, you know, or firings, I guess res- resignations of for- former coaches, and that we should still have some money left over from some of those buyouts. Um, that- well, and the thing with buyouts is you don't pay lump sums unless it's like, unless it's written in the contract that way. Typically, what happens, and I would imagine, I mean, I haven't read Sanford's contract. I probably could. Sanford's is eighteen months. Record. It's 18 months you have to pay it? Yeah. Okay. That's a little tighter than most. Um, but still, you don't have to pay a lump sum. You can pay it off over a year now. Well, I think, I mean, they structured that contract because they they gotten buyouts from every other coach. And that's why it was so much. They thought, oh, this guy is a big hot shot, rising star. Somebody's going to fuck him up and we're going to make more money and pay for the next coach and the next coach. Well, and this, we always this was the finally the time where it came to a head. Heck, he interviewed for Arizona last year after that mediocre season. Like he was going <laughs> to bounce at the at the first shot he got, but he just can't coach. So, and, and there's a lot of issues. My thing is, there's a lot of things that happen during games, and it's like that's that's common sense. You know, that's a that's a coaching 101 move that you should a punt the ball if it's on your side of the field. Um, B, you go for the easy points, which is a constant issue with him. Um, Rotating kickers, it just, ah. Well, I mean, even sticking with the same horse, metaphorically, for the quarterback. I mean, pick your guy and ride it out, and if somebody says, well, what about him, that's how, that's part of it. You know, um, somebody, there's always going to be somebody in the media or the fan base that's going to question the starting quarterback and yada, 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 but you know, you got to stick it out and ride it out and say, this is our guy, He, you know, we think this is it, just do it. Don't guess every single game and start a new quarterback, which is the most frustrating thing for me. Um, so, Ross, uh, kind of preview uh, something, I guess, that technically you're working on for Towrack. Um, with Bobby P being fired, is there a Bobby P part two? No. Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Hell no. I mean, you see the you know the Facebook groups and whatever that you know we kind of live in as kind of to see the pulse of the fans. There are some fans that are completely ignorant to what's gone down in Louisville. I mean, like basically what happened with Bobby there is he's so toxic, nobody wants to work with him. Blah 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 down the road, and his team literally gave up on him. That's why he got fired two weeks before the season and is kind of putting Brom in these awkward situations where he has to answer press conference questions. You think that's going to magically, at a program with less resources, with you know, with everything else, it's going to work again? No, it's not. He's you know, you you take a coach that's young and dumb or young and not dumb like Sanford to him, who's just a stone cold disciplinarian and unlikable it's there's going to be a revolt i mean i saw leo peckinpah said he was the most hated man in bowling green for his one season in the hundred years of western kentucky football i mean we we yeah. survived him we got one year i'm sure you can get matt mckay to ramble on about him all the time but like <laughs> you know he gave us brahm he gave us hold he gave us 
you know, he kept the train running. I appreciate that, but you know, just look at Louisville. Don't don't make their mistake twice. You know, don't bring him in to to fix something. I don't know. It just ugh, I, our I, fans are dumb sometimes. <laughs> I agree, and that's and what my big issue is. I actually, um, my brother's birthday is next week, and I went out and we were talking and celebrating his birthday, and him and my father both kind of cornered me and was like. Do you think Bobby Petrino's coming to to Western? And I was like, No, God no. And they're like, Well, why not? You know, he's a Power Five coach, blah blah blah. And I was like, It's not going to happen again. And here's my metaphor I used with them. I said Bobby Petrino, when he came to Western the first time, was like Pamela Anderson in the nineties. He was a hot right. commodity. <laughs> am, I, am I right? He was a hot commodity. He was not necessarily damaged, but he was still a high-profile coach. Um, well, he was damaged, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was damaged, but he still had potential. But he was damaged in reputation and not in his actual performance on the field. Exactly. He, True. he romper stomped through a bad conference while he was at Louisville, and, but with admittedly some great wins, right? I mean, he did, I mean, first, you know, First proper, like, really good bowl wins. I mean, all this crazy stuff. And then, I mean, he's great at what Arkansas. he did at Arkansas was good. I mean, aside from, you know, Gino's wife and all that. But on the field stuff was excellent. <laughs> but, and when he came to Western, it wasn't excellent, but it was it was good. It was good enough. It kept, it continued to build. It left a good staff. It left some players. Like, it was good. And we got paid. And, and we got what? Yeah, he paid us, paid us $800,000 oh, to coach a season. Yes, Gotta and, love that. and of course my metaphor um, was that was you know Pam Anderson in the '90s, and now he's like Pam Anderson today. Do y'all know what Pam Anderson's doing now? Exactly. Nobody has any clue, and nobody really wants to know what she's doing right now. Nope. Um, I hope retired and <laughs> from what I from no joke. Apparently, from, she had, according to the National Choir, she had a DWTS leg explosion, whatever that means. D W T S. Oh, wait, what? <laughs> hold on, hold on. Did she no say leg explosion? That's, I just Google searched Pam Anderson and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's the National <laughs> Enquirer too. <laughs> we have to kind of take that with a grain of salt. Um, yeah. No joke, though. I did hear somebody tell on the radio that if you were wanting Pam Anderson or somebody to come to your birthday party, all you had to do was pay her like five hundred bucks. And I was like, oh, kind of seems really? Like a bargain. Yeah, uh, but well, you say bargain. I say I don't know about that. Um, I mean, well, I mean you could charge two bucks. You could charge a couple bucks admission, and I bet you break even or make a little bit. I bet you would, <laughs> depending on what you paid to do. I've, I think you very. Oh, easily she could. she messed up her leg on Dancing with the Stars. Apparently, that's, that's what, what it is. I was I, I was so lost with D W T S. I was like, what in the she, flip is that? I'm I'm sorry, but you did say leg explosion. Right? Yeah, I think she might have had like a Kevin Ware issue or some stuff. I don't know. Because <laughs> I didn't. At first, I thought you were going to say like a DWI, and I was like, oh, that doesn't surprise me. And then you said some other letters. Okay, then I got confused. And then you said leg explosion. And I was like, did she get shot? Did she have like calf implants that like popped on a plane? Like, what? Honestly, when you were like DWTS leg explosion, I thought like an ankle monitor malfunctioned and it exploded on her. That's where my head went. I was like, does those things explode? Well, I mean, there was some explosion on her during that Tommy Wee video, but that's, that's the here and there. Yeah. Hope you enjoyed the clip from our latest episode. Subscribe for our weekly Red Out podcast. And always remember, go Tops.